start chapter one of this uh, class, and it's a very classical uh, chapter about the RSK called the Robinson Schoenstatt correspondence. So it's a correspondence which has been used many, many times. There's hundreds of papers on it, extension of the correspondence. So this is our starting point for this uh, course on the cellular on that. First, I will define Young tableau. So first, you give a partition of an integer. A partition is a sequence of numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc., lambda k, <coughs> such that the sum of this non-zero integer is equal to n. And the lambda i are called the part of the partition. So this is very classical uh, object to decompose the numbers into a sum of positive numbers and you don't involve, you are, you are not involved with in which order you put the part lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda k. So you can put them in decreasing order and part can be repeated. It's weakly decreasing order. So usually there is a geometric interpretation of this which is called a Ferrer diagram. So here is example n equal 12. 12 have been decomposed into 5 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2. And you put the part of the partition as a number, as a rows. Number of cells in each row is exactly the part. So this is lambda 1 equal 5, lambda 2 equal 3, lambda 3 equal 2, and 2. And you put them left justify so that you get like a hook. You see, there is this diagram and uh, the border, north border is like a path going down and here you have a hook. And so this is very usual way to see a partition as a geometric uh, diagram. So in combinatorics, we call this Ferrer diagram. It was introduced by Ferrer in the end of the 19th century, very long time ago. And in physics, they prefer to call this a Jung diagram. So don't confuse between Jung diagram and Jung tableau. So to define a Jung tableau, first you have to define a Ferrer diagram, and then a Jung tableau is going to be a filling of the cell of this diagram by some numbers with three conditions. So the number are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 until n, so each number between 1 and n appears 1 and only once. There is no repetition of letters, and each number between 1 and n appear. So this is the first condition. So here n equals 12, and you have the 12 numbers between 1 and 12. Second condition, the number go increasing in the row from left to right. So they are strictly increasing because all the numbers di are different. And the number go increasing in column from bottom to top. So this is called Jung tableau with its three conditions. And usually the partition lambda or the Ferrer diagram is called the shape of the Young tableau. Should and it be called standard? Yes, standard. I just write it on the blackboard standard Young tableau. Because we will be involved with semi standard Young tableau, which means the numbers going weakly increasing in the row. You have repetition of letters. But for the beginning of this, in this lecture, I will only, only work with standard Young tableau, which is going to be the robinson schoenstatt correspondence. The RSK with the Knut is an extension to permutation with repetition of letters. And then it will be semi-standard Young tableau. But for this today, it will be only standard Young tableau. And there is a classical covetal problem. What is a number of such Young tableau with a given shape. You give the shape, 
lambda, the partition. How many young tableau, standard young tableau with a given shape? So I denote this number by f index lambda, the number of young tableau with a given shape. And this is a very well known, very famous quantile problem. There exists some formula, some complicated formula by McMahon in the beginning of the 19th century with a big determinant. But there is a very nice formula, which is called the hook length formula, which was given by Frame Robinson Sol in 54. It's a very beautiful formula. I will not give a proof. It's a deep and there is many, many different proofs of this formula. So I just state for the first lecture the, the formula. So let's take a Ferrer diagram and you choose an SL inside the Ferrer diagram and I call the hook. The hook of the cell is all the cells at the right of this cell, all the blue cells above the cell, plus the cell itself. So the hook is all this. I am writing everything in French notation. The French diagram is going up. In British notation, it's going down. So this is the hook. And the hook length is the number of cells of the hook. How many cells? Here is, there is five. So for each cell of the Jung of the of the Ferrer diagram, you can associate a hook length. And here are all the hook lengths associated to this Ferrer diagram. So you have eight because it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here you have four, one, two, three, four. So for each cell you associate hook number, and the formula is the following. The number of such Young tableau with a given shape lambda is exactly n factorial divided by the product of all the hook lengths. The product is over all the cells of the Ferrer diagram. X, all possible cells. For each cell there is a hook length. You take this product product of hook lengths, and that is not obvious that this product divides n factorial, and the ratio is exactly an integer, and this integer is exactly f lambda, the number of Young tableau with a given shape. So this is one of the g of the enumerative combinatorics. There is many proof, combinatorial, bijective, and probabilistic, but all proofs are really deep and uh, not obvious. So I give an example with this shape. F of this shape is equal to n factorial, the product of all the numbers from 1 to 12, divided by all the hook lengths, all the green numbers. And you can check in this example that this green product divides the numerator, and the ratio is exactly this. It's a product of small prime numbers, and it's 4,455. You are not okay, Suresh? Yeah. <laughs> you agree? <laughs> well, you can check. I hope I don't make mistake. So this is a hook. The number of Young tableau is a very. It's a product of prime number very small. If you like experiment mathematics, you can guess the formula when the number of such things is very small prime numbers, then by moving the shape, by making some experiment, you can more or less guess that the hook lengths are involved. In the first lecture overview of the class, I give you the example of Alternstein matrices, where also the number of such matrix is a product of numerator divided by another product, so the prime numbers are very small, and in that case it was guessed by, uh, by computer, by experiment. So I like experimental combinatorics. is also experimental combinatorics. We look like physicists making some experiment, guessing formula, and then you have to prove the formula. So an introduction to robinson schoenstedt correspondence. R is for Robinson, and S for Schoenstedt. This go back to in the 30s and in the 60s by Schoenstedt. So RS, Robinson-Schoenstedt correspondence. 
the k, Knut will come later, Rsk. So first, let's, let's list all the Jung tableau with n equal 4. For n equal 4, you see there is five different partitions, five shapes of Jung tableau. Diagram or oh, Jung diagram, Jung diagram, Ferret diagram, and then below I put in purple the number of standard Jung tableau for each shape. So else you apply the hook lens formula, or in this example you can list immediately the number of standard Jung tableau. Here there is only one. Here there is three Jung tableau, three Jung tableau, two, and one. So the total number of Jung tableau for n equal four is ten. But there is an amazing identity that if you take the square of each of these purple numbers, so it's 1, 9, 9, 4, and 1, and you take the sum of all these squares, you get 24, <coughs> which is 4 factorial. And this is true in general, that the sum of the square of all the f lambda for all possible shape with a fixed n is going to be n factorial. So you have these identities, that the sum of f lambda to the square over all partition of n is exactly n factorial. So this means that it should be, that it should exist a bijection, a correspondence between all permutation like this must be in bijection with a pair of young tableau with the same shape. You fix the shape, lambda. F lambda is for example the number of such red young tableau. To the square, so you have another F lambda in blue. The number of pairs is going to be f lambda to the square, and the sum of all possible pairs like this with the same shape is, must be n factorial. And this correspondence, this bijection, is given in many different ways. Always it's the same bijection appearing. It's, it's very famous, very classical, one of the jewels of the combinatorics, the diamond inside the bijective world of combinatorics. That there is a bijection between permutation and pair of standard Young tableau having the same shape. So the classical algorithm, the classical bijection, is described the first time by Schoenstedt in 61. It was implicit in Robinson in the, in the 30s. Maybe Robinson implicitly defined the P symbol, then Little Wood defined also the Q symbol, and it's well known now the Schoenstedt insertion process. So I explain this algorithm with an example. It's a recursive algorithm. So if, if you are familiar with computer science and recursive algorithm, but let's give an example. So let's start with this permutation. The red number, this is a sigma 1, sigma of 2, sigma of 3. So this is the permutation. In this class, sometimes I will uh, use, I will write a permutation as a word. This is a word on the letters 1, 2, etc., n. Or sometimes you write a permutation like a bijection from the set of, of the first n integer to the set of n integer. So this is kind of the notation of the bijection. Or also, you, if you just read the red number, this is a word in the letter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, n. So here is my permutation on 10 elements. And I'm going to construct the P symbol and the Q symbol. So this will be the P symbol, which is called the insertion tableau. And the Q will be here, which is called the recording tableau. So the, the way I'm construct, going to construct P and Q are completely different. So you read the permutation from left to right. So the first element of the permutation, the first letter of the word in red is 3. So I insert, I put 3 in the P symbol. And then to remember that 3 was the first one, 
in blue, you see I am going to put the value in blue in the Q symbol. The first element of the permutation was a 3. Okay, now I read the second element. It's a 1. The idea would be to put the 1 in the first row. But if I put the 1 here, 3, 1, it violates the condition to be increasing in row. So the 1 is going to bump. See, the 1 is going to bump the 3. The 1 replaces the 3, and the 3 go in the second row. And then to remember the new cell, see the P symbol, the new cell appear here. This was the second step of the algorithm. So I put a 2 here, the second step. To remember, each, each time the P symbol is going to be increased by one cell, and to remember where the cell appears, I will put the recording tableau in blue. So you, are, you will more better understanding when the algorithm is going on. Now I go to the 6. The 6. Okay, I can put the 6. Each time I try to put the new value on the first row. Here I can put it because 6 is bigger than 1. So I put the 6 here. The new cell which appear in the P symbol is this one, which has label 3. 1, 2, 3. So this is the blue number in the Q symbol, the red number in the P symbol. Now the 10. 10 again can be added at the first row. No problem. The new cell which appear in the new shape is 4, which I put here. This is the geographic position of the new cell. Each time which appear is a new in the insertion tableau. So now the 2. Okay, I'm going to insert the 2 in the first row. Where to put the 2? The rule is the following. You look the number in the first row, and you look all the numbers which are less than the value you want to insert. So the number less than the 2, there is only 1. If there are several numbers, you take the maximum of the number which are less than the new entry you want to add in the first row. So this is the... And then the, the 2 is going to bump the 6. Okay, the 6. The 2 bumps the 6. Now the 6 is inserted in the second row in the same recursive algorithm. So you try to put the 6 in the second row. If it works, you do it. If it doesn't work, again, you are going to bump a new value. So the 6 is come here, and the 5 is inserted while the new cell appears in the second row. So 1, 5. Now I am going to, in, to insert the 5, this one, the six, num value number 6 of the permutation. So the 5 is going to bump all the values less than 5 are 1 and 2. So the 5 is going to bump the 10. The 10 is inserted here. And then the new value is 6. Now the 8, no problem. I can put it in the first row. The new value is 7. Now the 4. So 4, you insert it, it's going to bump the 5, uh, the smallest of the value bigger than 4, or the next value of, yes, maybe I make, uh, it's the smallest value of the value bigger than the value I'm going to insert. So, uh, so the 4 is going to bump the 5, the 5, I take the small, smallest of the value bigger than 5 is 10. It's, sorry. <laughs> yes. The smallest of the value bigger than 5, 6 and 10 is 6. So I insert. The 5 is going to bump the 6. And the 6 is inserted in the third row, and I get here. Now the 9, no problem to insert. Now the 7. I take the smallest of the biggest value, which is 8. 7 is bump the 8. The 8 
So I take the smallest or the value bigger than 8 is 10. 10 is bumped by the, and then you have 10. And then you get a pair PQ of two Young tableau, standard Young tableau, and I claim that this is a bijection. This is a P symbol, this is a Q symbol. I claim that this is a bijection. So to claim this, I'm going to do the reverse algorithm. The reverse algorithm is the following. You can go backward in your algorithm. So you go to the recording tableau and you look the biggest value, the 10, n equal 10. So this was the last value added in the algorithm. It was 10, so the last value. So somebody, 10 was here, the last value, and somebody bumped the 10. The 10 came from the second row. And now, the rule is who bumps the 10? And the rule is now it's a maximum of the smallest element. Take all the smallest element of the second row. The bigger of the is 8. So 8, it's a small lemma you can check, that the 10 was bumped by the 8, the biggest value of the smallest, all value smaller than 10 in the second row. So 8 was coming for the first row. So who bumps the 8? It's a 7, the biggest value of less than 8. So 8. And so 7 was inserted in the first row. So you check, you see, 10, 7. 7 was the last letter which was inserted in the robinson schoenstedt algorithm. And then you continue like this recursively. The next one will be the 9. 9 was inserted. This was the 9, etc. So going backward, you can recover completely the permutation. And this is the bijection. And this is the famous robinson schoenstedt correspondence between permutation and pair of standard Young tableau with the same shape. So immediately you can ask a question. A natural question is, is there is a natural involution on pair of tableau. If you have a pair PQ and you exchange Q and P, what is the analog permutation? What is involution of permutation which correspond to exchanging P and Q? So let's do it. We have a permutation, a pair PQ of two young tableau. I put them here and exchange them. So this becomes the recording tableau Q, and this becomes the recording tableau, the insertion tableau P. And let's do the reverse algorithm on the pair QP now. I have exchanged P and Q. So this is the last value which were inserted was. Oh, there should be a 10 here. The box was too small to put the one, and when I change the between small slide and large in large format, so this would be a 10. Uh, and then the 10 was bumped by the 6. The 6 was bumped by the 4, and uh, so the first value was 4. And then the next value is 9. The next one is 8. 8. So this value was bumped to 10. 10 was bumped by, by 7, etc. So this, was, this is a 10 right here. So the next one, 6. 6 was bumped by the 8. The 8 was bumped by the 5. And the 5 was bumped by the 3. And then 5. It was this value, 8 which I bump was bumped by the 6. And then the uh, next one is uh, this value. And then the 3 corresponds to 2, which was bumped by the 1. 
and now the next one is two five and one two. So you get this new permutation. So this was the first permutation which corresponds to the pair PQ. This is the permutation corresponding to QP. What is the relationship between these two permutations? If you look carefully, you see three go to go to six, six go to three, and seven go to eight, eight go to seven. Anyway, so this means that this permutation is just the inverse of this permutation. So this is a kind of miracle because if you take a permutation, do all the insertion process, you get P and Q. Then reverse Q and P. Do the reverse algorithm, what you get at the end is exactly the inverse of a permutation. So this kind of magic and Donald Knut in his volume three, The Art of Computer Programming, he has written that the there's some kind of magic or witchcraft which it uh, behave between the scene. And it's the occasion to celebrate uh, Knut is just having 80 years old. And there is a meeting in Sweden to celebrate uh, 80 years. And this meeting is starting today. It's in uh, in Sweden, in Pitea, and uh, they are going to play Fantasia Apocalyptica. It's a pipe organ. It was written, it is written by Donald Knut. So you know he's very good in, uh, this is in his house. He has a, a big pipe organ, and uh, if you want to invite him, you have to find a cathedral where there is a big pipe organ, and it's going to be played for this uh, 80 years uh, birthday. Uh, Fantasia that he has written himself is so, so happy birthday <laughs> don't <need. laughs> so more about the group theory and the group of permutation so the Robinson Schoenstatt correspondence uh, it's a the visible part of an iceberg which we, we have shown the bijection between permutation and uh, pair of Jung tableau. But in fact, this can be proved. This comes, in fact, from representation, representation theory of groups. So the five following minutes, it's for people who don't know anything about representation of groups. So some very elementary, just to give you a flavor of this uh, connection. So for any group, uh, G, uh, representation, is you try to find, to send the group as a group of transformation, a group of uh, operator acting on something. So usually you take a group G to send a homomorphism on the group of inverse, invertible matrix N of size N by N. So you look G as a group of transformation. And this is very, for example, very useful in physics, uh, the standard model of particles. There's many transformation, homomorphism, and representation of group finite groups. So this is why also they, they're interested in Jung tableau, Jung uh, diagram, all this is very classical in physics. But it comes in the context of unitary groups. Yes, unitary group is not, uh, not the same as the permutation group, but there is a, for many finite groups, many groups or infinite groups, there is a representation theory. And a, so I'm not going to talk about this. It's just for students who don't know anything on representation theory, just to give them a flavor of what it is, it's a, to represent a group as a group of, uh, of, uh, of transformation, or a group of invertible matrices, and uh, there is classical representation of SU, etc., of some groups, or Lie groups, which give you the, uh, the standard model of particles. So it's uh, like an uh, analog of, you know, in a, in a number theory, any numbers is a new, unique way, a product of prime numbers, and there is analog, it's maybe a very vague analog, but any representation can be written as a product, as a sum, of irreducible representation. So the notion of irreducible representation in a group, like in numbers, the prime numbers, it's belong, it's a, the factorization of a prime numbers. And then in the case, in the case of a symmetry group, 
of the group of permutation, irreducible remutation are in bijection with partition of the integer n. And then there is a dimension of the irreducible remutation. It is, it's the size of the n by n matrix. And the dimension of this irreducible augmentation for the case of the symmetry group is exactly f lambda, the number of young tableau with the shape lambda. <coughs> and then there is a very classical proposition in finite group theory that the order of the group, the number of elements of, in the case of the finite group, is exactly equal to the sum of the square of the irreducible augmentation. So this degree can be very big. In the example of the beginning with my partition, there was four, more than 4,000 young tableau. So the size of the matrix for this Ferret diagram is uh, 4,555. It's a, it's a big, uh, big matrix. And then it's in the case if you apply this identity in the case of symmetry group, you get the order of the group, n factorial, is going to be exactly the sum of the degree of the irreducible representation, which is exactly the sum of the Young tableau associated to each partition lambda. So this can be another proof using the representation of finite group, another proof of the fact that uh, permutations are in one-to-one -one correspondence with pair of Young tableau. But in this course, it's a combinatorics course with some bijective flavor. So I love bijection, and I give you only the proof with bijective proof. So now there is a second, second version of the RS correspondence, of the Schoenstedt insertion. So the second description is a geometric version of RSK. In fact, here it will be RS, so we, we will have a geometric version of RSK with some light and shadow lines. So we have a permutation. I take the same example as before for the insertion Schoenstedt algorithm. You have my permutation sigma, 3, 1, 6, 10, 2, etc. You have a planarization of the permutation. So you associate, you take the grid n by n, the square grid, this interval 1 to n multiplied by 1 to n, and the graph of the permutation, it's a set of points, which are exactly the point i, sigma i, for all the index i equal 1 to n. So here you see in the first column, you put the points at the level 3, second column is 1, and 6, you put a point i equal 6, sigma of i equal, uh, I, no, i equal 3, sigma of i equal 6. So it is a planarization, a way, geometric way to see the permutation. Or it's called also a tower placement. You put some tower on the grid, such as that, there is uh, one and only one tower in each column and each row. So this is a visual way to see the permutation as a subset of the square lattice with n row and n column. And then I am going to put some light in this picture. There is four different corners. So I put some light and I have a choice. Southwest, southeast, northwest, northeast. So I put some light in my picture coming from the southwest. And I define the shadow of a point, like this point. It's all this part on the northeast of the point. In fact, there is an, uh, if you take the segment, if you take the square lattice, there is natural order on the square lattice. It's a product of the two natural order, order of integer 1 to n, 1 to n. So the point here is, this, is less than this point. The order is going to the northeast. And I take the ideal generated by, all the, by this point. All the points 
which are the northeast of this point. Or geometrically, you see, visual way to see this is to put it the shadow of the point. And then I define the shadow of a permutation to be the union of all the shadows. So some points, you don't see them, they are in the shadow of the, this is the two points in full light. And then from this picture, it defines the border of the shadow. Uh, it's written here, the, this black line. This will be the first step of the geometric construction. Take the shadow of the permutation, union of shadow of all the points of the permutation, take the border of the shadow, and you get this broken line with two points of the permutation here. Then the remaining point, which pair is the shadow of the permutation, I can repeat the construction, put again uh, on the re remaining point. Suppose you delete this uh, black line and take again the shadow of all these points. And you get this uh, shadow, take the border of the second shadow, and take the point which remains, and repeat the construction. Each time I am going to take the shadow of this remaining point, take the border of the shadow, and you repeat the construction with five steps of putting some light in my points. I get all the black points of the permutation belong to one of these uh, black lines here, these five border of shadow, five black lines, and each point of the permutation belong to one of the corner southwest point of this black line. Now, if you look at the picture, each of these broken line, line, some new point appear in the picture. I put a red point. The red points are all these new points appearing as, as the northeast corner of a black line. See, the number of red points is the number of black points minus the number of black lines. And there was 10 black points, there is 5 black lines, so I have 5 red points, 10 minus 5 equals 5. And I look carefully at this red point. In the original papers, it was called the skeleton of the permutation. Skeleton of the permutation is a set of red points. And there is a lemma which says the following. Uh, the skeleton of a permutation is a coding of the permutation. What does it mean? It means that if you know the red points on the grid n by n, you can reconstruct the black point. Uh, so, which means there is a bijection between the permutation or the geometric way to write the permutation and the skeleton, which is a subset of the grid n by n. n means, in between bracket means all, all the points between 1 and n. Uh, maybe it's not obvious. How to reconstruct the black point from the red point? Try to imagine the reverse construction. So I shall already guess <laughs> the construction. So proof. Take your red points, take your black lines, and I'm going to add some new points. See, on the top of each of these five black lines, I'm going to add some new red points, such that they go increasing to the northeast when you follow this uh, red point. It's an increasing sequence in the on the lattice, on this grid lattice. 
So you put anywhere you put, but all these red points must be outside this grid n by n. So you put the first red point anywhere on the on this black line above the the, the level n. Then you put a second red point which must be increasing, which must be as a, strictly the north east of this one. Then you put a third red point. So you put them increasing in this uh, black line. Again, also you put do the same thing. All the black line which go on the right of your picture, you put an increasing sequence of red points outside the grid n by n. So anywhere you put it, it must be increasing. So I have added 10 new red points. And then I put some light from the northeast. What I have done from the southwest, putting some light on my point, I can put some light from the northeast. So put some light on the union of the previous red points coming from the, the skeleton, union all these new red points. If you put some light from the northeast, you get this line, these new black lines, and you see that the skeleton of all these new red points, all the red points, the skeleton is exactly the black point of the permutation. Uh, you get back the black points by starting from the red points you get from the permutation, adding these, all these new red points, taking, putting the light, the light algorithm from the northeast, and you get the analog, skeleton of this big uh, union of red points, and the skeleton, what you will get, the red point of the red point, will be exactly the black point of the permutation. So see, it's very simple, but you have to, you have to get to imagine this uh, construction going uh, southwest or going northeast. How hmm? do No, but the black line, you see, I, I know the red points. Yeah. You give me the red points. Okay? So you look at the missing ah, Okay, good, very good question. <laughs> the black, these red points are on the missing column. If you look the red points. So there is some column which are empty. The missing column, this one, this one, this one and missing uh, some row which are empty, there is no red points. So you add your new red points on the, on the empty columns or empty rows where there is no red points. Okay, forget. <laughs> I put the picture with the black line, but they, we don't know where are the black line. Okay, so once I have defined this uh, red point, then I put the light like this and uh, I get the back the black points. So now, if you, I know the red points on the grid, n by n, I can again apply the same process to get the skeleton of the red points, which will be an encoding of my red points. So take your red points. Maybe I put, the I put back the black also, but if I just, just consider the red points, so you have no new points appearing. Yeah, the red of the red, I put them blue. So blue points appear. The blue points is the skeleton of the skeleton, which will be a coding of the red points. Now you apply again the geometric construction of the blue point, and there is no green point. There is no other color. I have finished completely. See, the, the two blue lines, there is no no corner analog of red points. So this is the end of the construction. You have a first set sequence of shadow which gives you the black line, then the second second of shadow giving you the red points, third second gives you the blue points, I, I have finished. Now I claim that if I just see this, right, if I forget completely what, uh, what is inside the square, if you just see this color going up 
and the color going on the right. I claim that this, what you see, is a coding of the permutation. I claim that from this sequence of colors, you can completely reconstruct the permutation. And the proof is that if you go the green skeleton, the skeleton, the skeleton, the skeleton is empty. So the empty set, I am joking, is a coding of the permutation. But what means coding the empty set? You have to, you can reconstruct the blue points if you know in which row, in which column are the blue points. So if you know the green points which are empty, you can reconstruct them. There was a two by two grid for the blue points. Once you know the blue points, if, if you know in which row and column are the red points, if you know the local grid for the red points, knowing the skeleton, so the blue point, you can reconstruct the red points. And when you know the red points plus the grid, the black grid of the n by n uh, the permutation, then you can reconstruct the permutation. So in fact, what you, what you need is just to know the, the position in which row in each column there exists black point, red point, blue point. So you see these five segments in black are exactly the position of the row where there exists black point. This is exactly the position of the row where there exists black point. Now in red, this is the three position, three columns where there exists red point, three columns where I, three row where there exists red point. So you know the three by three grid for the red point, the two by two grid for the blue points and the empty set for the green point. And from this, you can reconstruct the permutation by applying the, the lemma that the skeleton is a, is a coding of the permutation. But when you have local permutation, quasi-permutation in the subgrid, then you have to know in which grid you are working. You have to know the position of the row and column for each color of the point. So I am going to, to define what happens, of, this is a word in black, red, etc. So I define a Yamanushi word. Yamanushi word is a word with letters 1, 2, etc. N. This is called the free monoid, generated by an alphabet. Free monoid is a set of words generated by a second alphabet. Here the alphabet is an integer 1, 2, 3, N. And a Yamanushi word definition it's a word in this letter, such as that if you cut your word W as a product of two words, U and V, in the free monoids, the product of words is just a concatenation of two words. You have the word U, the word V, and you put them uh, concatenate. So if you take a Yamanushi word, means that if you cut your word at any place, then the number of times one is appearing in U is bigger or equal to the number of times two is appearing in U, etc. So there is the number of occurrence of each letter in this uh, U is weakly increasing seconds. So this is a definition of a Yamanoshi word. And I claim that this so here is, I have a Yamanoshi word. You see, if I put in black, the first color was black, I put the number one. Second color, which was the two, I put the number two. And for the blue, I put the label three. And so each label i is a color at the i step number i in the construction. So you can check that this is a Yamanoshi word. Number of time, if I cut here, you see. The three appears three times, the one appears three times, the two appears two times. Here the three appears, uh, here the one appears four times, the two appears three times. So each time, for each, any left factor of this word, the number of one is bigger or equal to the number of two, number of two bigger or equal to the number of three. So this comes from the geometric construction. It is very easy to, to show that from the geometric construction you have this uh, this condition to be a Yamanoshi word, the sequence of one, two, three, which is black, red, blue, green, etc. And Yamanoshi word is just a coding of standard Young tableau. So the bijection is the following. Here is a standard Young tableau. I think it should be P, in fact. So this is a, in the first row, you have the number one, three, four, seven, nine. 
And this is index in this Yamanushi word. What are the index of the letters one? It has index one, three, four, and nine, and seven also. So the five letters equal to one in W, which is are the, the five appearance of the black uh, line, have index. If I, uh, this is the numbering of the black one, two, three, four, five, six, till n. So this is the index is one, three, four, seven, nine. Now the red numbers, the second row, two, five, six, is encoded by the index of the letters two in the Yamanashi word, which are the index are two, two, five, six. And the third row, A10, A10. So I, we will use many times when I will do local rule, Yamanushi uh, word. It's a coding of the Young tableau with some uh, letters, uh, integer letters. And, uh, and each letters I corresponds the color I in the geometric uh, construction. And you can check, you see, in the, if I take these two, two Yaman, the two Yamanushi words associated to this, this will be the... This will be the Q symbol here, and this will be the P symbol. And so this is a geometric version of the algorithm that from the previous lemma, I have a bijection between permutation. I can completely reconstruct my permutation from this. What I see, and what I see is a coding of PQ. So this is another way to find the pair, pair PQ. And in fact, if I look at the Schoenstedt insertion, I get exactly the same pair PQ. So the geometric construction giving you a pair PQ is exactly the same, is equivalent to the Schoenstedt insertion with a bumping process. In this geometric way, now you can uh, you can find the witchcraft which is behind the scene, given which we're talking by Donald Knut. In fact, it's not a mystery though, now that exchanging P and Q is exactly taking the inverse of the permutation. Why? Because exchanging P and Q is making the mirror image to the diagonal, the symmetry of the diagonal of this geometric picture, and making the mirror image the, the mirror image of the diagonal of the permutation is exactly, exactly taking the inverse. You exchange i, sigma i, and so it's very natural now. This, this symmetry is very natural if you take the geometric construction. But you have to prove that the geometric construction, which is symmetric in row and column, is equivalent to the Schoenstatt insertion. So there was two algorithms, you see, two with the sunset insertion, P and Q was totally different construction. There was the insertion tableau, the, the recording tableau, and now in the geometric construction, they the same row and column play exactly the same role. P and Q, you can exchange them. So you have to prove that, that the two algorithms are equivalent. Before giving the, this proof, I can immediately deduce that if P equal Q, this means that sigma equals sigma minus one. So it means that you have a, an involution. So Robinson Schoenstatt algorithm gives you a bijection between Young tableau and involution. If you give me a Young tableau P, I take Q equal P. So P, P, the pair P, P is going to be in bijection with an involution. So the total number of Young tableau on n elements is exactly the number of involution on n elements, so which, which there is a very simple formula in classical enumerative uh, combinatorics. So now next step, proof of the equivalence between insertion by Schoenstatt and the geometric construction with shadow, light and shadow. So here, you see, I take my whole picture and I am reading this picture, geometric picture, row by row. Suppose I have already, I have already done the first point, the first insertion of the first uh, seven point. So here is a, I am in a certain step of the insertion uh, algorithm of Schoenstedt. 
So I am inserted the four, you see. I am here. I have inserted all these numbers, three, one, six, ten, two, five, eight. And I am inserting number four, which is the uh, value in blue numbers, eight. So see, I, I have, here I have, a, I don't look what is, what is here. But here I have, a, what, what uh, I suppose that for this pair of tableaux, I get the, the blue tableau is encoded by the, all the, all this number encodes the Q, Q tableau, or given by Schoenstatt. All this, this line here are encoding the P symbol given by the Schoenstatt algorithm. And I am going to prove that it's, if I insert a new point, what is changing in the color going outside of the grid is exactly equivalent to make the insertion of the new value in the tableau. So we say I have the value here, three, five. So here I have the P symbol, you see. So I have P symbol is, the first row is one, two, five, eight, which corresponds to one, two, and then five, you see, this corresponds to the indices of the black lines. Uh, here I have four black lines, one, two, then five and eight. There is three red lines, which are three, six, and 10. Of course, there is some line where there is no color going outside. It's because it's not yet, uh, the value have not yet appeared in the insertion algorithm. So now I am inserting the four. The four is here. So I am inserting the four, and I have to see what is in this color. The sequence of color here is a P symbol, and the sequence of color in the next row is a new P symbol when I am inserted the four. So I have to check that what happens of the change of colors, the change of colors given by the geometric construction, is exactly a coding of the insertion of four in this tableau. So when I am inserting four, you see the four is bumping the five, the smallest of all the elements bigger than four. And so, so it's bumping, you see, there is a, inserting the four. So you see what happens? There was a five, the black line here, five. Now the four is here, so a red point appears in the construction. And this red point corresponds exactly to the bumping of a five, where four is bumping the five. Now I have to insert five in the second row. So the five. This five, which were black, becomes red. And now inserting the five, again, you see the red line here is going to be changed in a blue line. Uh, the five is bumping the four. The four is, uh, no, the five is here, is bumping, sorry, is bumping the six. So this is the six. You see the, the six, which was red. Red means it's six in the second row. The six become blue which means six is going to be the third row. And this corresponds exactly to the construction of the blue point in this uh, red line. And now the six is inserted in the third row. So you see the six became a blue. And so this gives you the change of colors in this column give you the a coding of the insertion process. It just change of color going from uh, one column to another column. And now the new cell in the Q symbol is here. It's in the third row, which means that the new color, you see the color of the eight here, is blue, which means that eight is the third row of the Q symbol. So you can completely reconstruct the equivalence of the two algorithms. When you read your picture, with this piece of, uh, or this column by column. If you read column by column, what happened in, from one column to another is exactly a coding of the insertion in Q, and then the color appear at the top is exactly a coding of the Q. So you can feel now the difference. This sunset algorithm, it's going row by row, and the geometric algorithm, it's a symmetric in row and column. So you can also, you should be able to do the sunset by reading row by row. So this would be completely inverse Q and P. In fact, you can mix completely row and column. 
and uh, this geometric algorithm, so it's equivalent to the Schoenstatt algorithm. <coughs> so I have the proof of the equivalent of the two algorithms. So I have the proof that the uh, inverse permutation corresponds to a change in PAQ. So the first proof, of course, in, uh, was much uh, harder. But now it's very natural, you see, this. Uh, What is the fast proof of the first one? Fast proof? Well, I give a, this was the proof of the. Like in or the No, I don't understand. Sorry. This was the proof that the two algorithms are the same. No, you want no. to know when the first proof was given. Of what? Of the. Of what? Which yeah. one, of what? Of the. In 61, Schoenstatt uh, gave the. And in uh, 76, there was a proof of this equivalence given by the speaker. This was my first paper in Cometor X to, to show the, to make a geometric version and uh, to show the equivalence. And, and at this, it was in Strasbourg and there was J.W. de Robinson was there. So I was very impressed. He was impressed also too. But in fact, it's implicit that the Knut paper in 70, which is more or less implicit this construction as a partial order of the grid is implicit, but uh, I did not know uh, exactly, uh, but I, uh, I love geometry, and this was geometric way, and, uh, and it has been very popular now, the geometric way to see the, and even there is a, there is an apps, an application on, a, on the Apple Store, which shows this, uh, this construction. I will give you the address in the Apple Store, you can buy, uh, well, no, it's free, it's, uh, it's free, yeah, there is an application, by, very nice application about Robinson Schoenstatt and the shadow, etc. So exercise, there is a characterization of the red points. You can give a, a give a, so if you have the permutation in the skeleton, and how can you, because not all, it's, uh, if you take any subset of the, the grid, then it will not be necessarily the skeleton of a permutation. So what kind of a family of subsets are the skeleton of a permutation? So there's a nice characterization, also in the paper of the speaker in 76. <laughs> and uh, we define, uh, in the introduction of the class, I define the rotate diagram, so just repeat this definition. The rotate diagram of a permutation it's a, a set of points on the grid n by n. So in black, there is a permutation. And the rotate diagram are all the red points. Sorry for to confuse the, the red points and the, the color of the point before. But you put the red points. Each time, there is at the left, there is a black point, And below, there is a black point. So this has all the possible red points. And in fact, this is the coding of the inversion of the permutation. Uh, for each red point, each red point corresponds to a, an inversion of the permutation. Uh, an inversion of the permutation is a pair ij with i less than j and sigma i bigger than sigma j. So the number of elements of the rotate diagram is exactly the number of inversion of the permutation. Uh, you have a number of such a point is exactly so it was called Rote diagram. It's uh, Donald Knut again who discovered the paper of Rote in, uh, the, in exactly a long time ago, more than 200 years ago. And Rote he put uh, this diagram to prove that the number of inversion of permutation is equal to the number of inversion of the inverse permutation. And this was a geometric way, again, uh, bijective visual, visual proof that you have the same number of inversion for and taking the inverse and just taking the symmetry of this uh, of this diagram to the diagonal, and Donald Knut uh, showed that uh, he discovered this paper. So now I am going to play a NIM game on this uh, on this diagram. So you start from this position, and the game on the graph is you are allowed. It's two people are playing, and uh, you are allowed to move your point. 
The rule is you can move in at any point on the left. You stay on the rotate diagram. So you see you can put move to the left. Or also you can move below. You can go to any point of the rotate diagram. And then the other player will play. So each player will play alternatively. You take uh, your, your point and it's moving to the left or moving down on the staying on the rotate diagram of the permutation. And I claim that the, the red point of the permutation, the skeleton of the permutation, now in purple, are exactly the winning position of this game. The unique set of winning position. So what means the winning position in this game? It's in graph theory, it's called the kernel of the graph. A kernel of a graph means that any vertex of the graph is a source of an edge going to the kernel. Which means if you are outside the kernel, you can, you can go on the kernel. Now, if you are on the kernel, and if you do any movement, then you go outside of the kernel. So this is a winning position. As soon, you can always stay on the kernel, and your competitor, is, if he plays, he will go outside the kernel, and you can always go back to the kernel. And at the end, when you, you have finished, when you cannot move anymore, you win uh, the game. <coughs> and so it shows that the square, the skeleton of the permutation, are the winning position of the game, or are, are exactly the kernel of the graph. The rotate diagram is a graph. When you can move any edges, you can move to the left, move below in the rotate diagram. It's a graph, and in graph theory, if a graph, if there exists a kernel, then its kernel is unique. This is a theorem in graph theory. And in my case, if I take the rotate diagram as a graph, then the kernel of the graph is exactly the set of the skeleton of the permutation. See if I have uh, any purple point here. Then, uh, if you move left or below, you are you cannot meet a purple point. If I am outside like this, then I can always go to a purple point. If I take this point, I can go here. I can go here. If I take this point, I am outside the kernel. Then I can go back to the kernel. If I am in the kernel, you move any way you move, you will go outside of the kernel. So application of this uh, geometric construction, it's uh, interpretation of increasing and decreasing subsequence in the permutation. But what is the characterization of skeleton? The skeleton is exactly the kernel of the graph, of the rotate the graph formed by the rotate diagram. Say so I have a permutation. I have the rotate diagram are all the all the points in red and purple. This is the rotate diagram, and I can move on this diagram. The graph, the graph associated to the to this uh, rotate diagram is you put an edges between two points, if and only if you one point is the left of this point or one point is below this point. So there is many edges on the rotate diagram. It's all the possible movement in the game. All edges is two points of the rotate diagram where one point is on the left or one, po or one point is below. And in uh, the kernel of the graph is exactly this skeleton of the permutation. But, uh, finding the kernel of the, I mean, uh, finding the kernel. Recognize something is the kernel of the graph. Is it, uh, ah, it's, uh, maybe not. <laughs> no, it's uh, just a nice, for if you like graph theory, the so characterization in terms of kernel, but uh, but okay, you have to know that the kernel, if it if it exists, is unique. And then, so this this is the characterization uh, in terms of kernel of the graph. The first two exercises are the same. Uh, the second one is characterizing this point, and the first one is asking for the characterization. Uh, I don't know the characterization. It's a 
So the exercise is show that the kernel of this graph is exactly if that that shows that the skeleton of the permutation is satisfies the property to be a kernel of a graph. That shows that if you take this uh, skeleton, then it satisfies the two conditions to be a kernel. That if you are on the skeleton, you move and you the skeleton is a. a bit Characterization of the red point, it's a. Sorry, go back. To the kernel, you see, the two properties is that if you are. An, the kernel two properties is that every vertex of the graph is the source of an edge ending in the kernel. So if you are only any vertex, you can go to the kernel by following an edge of the graph. Now, if you have second condition, Every edge having the source in the kernel, then you go outside of the kernel. So you have to prove that these two conditions are satisfied by the skeleton. This is the exercise. And in game theory, this is uh, the same as winning position in the NIM game to be in the kernel or to be in the winning position. Yes? Uh, which point you want? Uh, you point a point? Uh, above. Above, yeah. Yes. So this vertex does not have any edge which uh, ending in the. No, this one. This vertex, you see, you, you can go here and you will be in the kernel. You will be. Or this point, you can go here. Oh, okay. So, huh? so an edge is between everything below and everything oh, below. Oh, no. It means if you are on this, on this, uh, any point of the rotate diagram. There is an edge starting from this point going to the kernel. So the edge, maybe you can go horizontally to the left or maybe below. Maybe both, but maybe only one, for example, this one. Below there is no, no point of the kernel, but on the left, then there is a point. So the possible edges are all the possible horizontal edges and all the possible vertical edges. I don't claim that you have to go both directions. There is only it's at not least. Just uh, no, it's no, not the no edges. It's, uh, it, edges mean uh, its point is connected to another point if this point is connected because it's on the left of this one. Uh, this was. Uh, see the possible uh, edges. This point is connected to this point because you can go to the left, you see. And this point is also connected to this point because you can go down, you see. So these are the possible edges of your graph, the rotate diagram at the vertices. Possible edges you can jump, huh? you can not necessarily adjacent. And then this skeleton is exactly satisfies the two conditions to be a kernel of the graph. And if you do graph theory, this is a characterization of the skeleton. If you know that there is when there is a kernel, there is only one. So application increasing and decreasing seconds. So in a permutation, we call an increasing subsequence. It's a subsequence, mean the subword of the permutation. Here I have a subsequence five, six, eight, nine, and the value of this uh, of this seconds go increasing. So an increasing subsequence corresponds to a set of points in the graph of the permutation, in the visualization on the grid, a set of points such that each point is at the northeast of the other point. So it's a subsequence, and not necessarily its consecutive value. So it's a subword, and the value goes increasing when you go from left to right to the permutation. So we, which means it goes to the northeast on the planarization. And proposition. For any permutation, 
So you get a pair PQ, and the problem you can ask, what is the characterization of the shape of the common Young tableau PNQ in terms of the permutation? So first characterization is that the first row, the number of, the number of elements in the first row of the PNQ symbol are exactly the maximum number of elements in an uh, increasing subsequence. If you take all increasing subsequence and take the maximum carnality possible for increasing subsequence, this is exactly the number of elements, the first row of the P and Q symbol. So this is very classical uh, theorem in, uh, in uh, the Robinson set correspondence. This gives you a way to find the maximum carnality of subse increasing subsequence. There's many work to give the asymptotic of this, etc. And the proof is the following. There is a nice visual proof, easy proof, with uh, taking the, the first uh, skeleton, taking the set of uh, the five black lines you have in our geometric construction. So see, there is the number of elements, the first row is exactly the number of black lines. So you have to show that uh, first, the number in the increasing subsequence, the number of elements is going to be bounded by the number of black lines. You cannot have two elements of an increasing subsequence in the same black line because the elements in the black lines are always decreasing. So the number of maximum carnality of increasing subsequence is bounded by five here. And then I have to show that there exists, there exists an increasing subsequence such that the cardinality is exactly, exactly five. The number of black lines or the number of elements in the first row. So here is a, a possible construction. So you take, you take the, the topmost black line, so take any point of this black line, and then, then you can go down, you are going to hit a black line, go left, and then you will hit a point in the black line below. So for any point, you see, you can, well, there is many different ways to do it. You can take, for any point in the black line, take the southwest corner of this, and then it's going to intersect the black line just below, and maybe there is several points, but one process should be to go down, go left, go down, go left. So you are selecting, for each black line, it's easy to select one point such that this point form an increasing subsequence. Now we have the same analog theorem for decreasing subsequence. We have now theorem that decreasing subsequence here is a decreasing subsequence with three elements. And the dual theorem, the analog should be that uh, if you have again a pair PQ, then the number of elements of the first column is going to be the maximum element of decreasing subsequence. So this is a dual theorem that exactly the analog, decreasing subsequence, maximum carnality, give you the number of elements, the first column. But now the proof with geometric construction is totally different. You cannot just apply a duality. It's a, it's a deep, there is a duality we will see next time. If I change the, color, the light from the northwest, then all the construction will be different. And it, it, there is a deep connection between the two constructions, which is a duality, Schuttenberg duality, which use uh, involution with Jeu de Taquin. But let's, there is a direct proof of this uh, lemma that the, the direct proof use uh, again the geometric construction, but in a different way that for increasing subsequence. So there's a lemma that if you have a permutation, take any decreasing subsequence of the skeleton, then from this decreasing subsequence with k element, you can construct a decreasing subsequence of the permutation with k plus one element. So here an example. I have my permutation. I take two points of the skeleton. Two points of the skeleton. I claim that I can construct two points in decreasing subsequence. I can construct a decreasing subsequence with k plus one element, k equal two, so with three elements. 
So to do it again, yeah, I am going to put some light for the northeast. I have this shadow, this uh, broken line, the border of the shadow of these two points. And the green line, you can easily construct, it's going to intersect the black line, and you can find easily three points in the intersection. So the geometry gives you immediately, you see, and it's decreasing subsequence in the skeleton, putting some light from the northeast, you get the border of this light in green, and it's going to intersect. This is uh, very natural to see. You can find K plus one point of the permutation. So if I apply this lemma now, if I get a permutation, see the number of columns, no, the number of elements, the first column, is exactly the number of colors you have used. So there is three colors, so the number of elements, the first column, is three. So starting from the topmost uh, color, the blue, which gives you one element, it's a single uh, decreasing subsequence. So if you apply this algorithm, you can find a decreasing subsequence in the skeleton with two elements. If uh, you apply again the lemma, you can, from this, you put some light and go back to the black point and you get a three element decreasing subsequence. And so this is a completely different proof. Right? It's totally different uh, to put the light from the left, the light from the north, uh, north, uh, northwest. So this gives you a, a proof that decreasing and increasing subsequence, the maximum carnality, give you the number of elements, the first and second row. No, it's the first column and the first row. And the consequence is uh, to reprove an old theorem of, uh, of Erdos in, in the 30s. This is an old theorem that if you take a permutation on n elements, such that the number of elements is bigger or equal to capital N to the square, then there exists increasing or decreasing subsequence of order bigger than capital N. For example, if you take a permutation with 100 elements, 110, 100 elements, then you are sure to find an increasing subsequence of size 10 or a decreasing subsequence of size 10. And the proof is that here is n by n square, and the shape of the corresponding P or Q symbol, here is the shape, and the shape is going to overlap your rectangle n by n. If the number of uh, yellow points is bigger, or equal to n to the square, you are sure that the row, first row or first column of your Young diagram is going to, to be at least of size capital N. And uh, maybe I have five minutes more. I will finish a theorem, a deep theorem without proof, the green theorem in uh, 74. But this is the extension of this increasing, decreasing subsequence to give an interpretation of the shape, all the shape of the Jung diagram. What is an interpretation of the number element of second row, number element of the third row, number element of second column? So there is no direct interpretation of element of the second row. There is a, an interpretation of number of elements in the first k row. If you take the first row, for example, there is an interpretation in a number of elements of the first two, first three, first k. So the so for denote we denote for a permutation i k of sigma and d l of sigma. It's a maximum number of elements in a union of k increasing subsequence. Take uh, integer k, take a permutation. And you take the union of k increasing subsequence, and it takes the maximum cardinality of a union of k increasing subsequence. And dl, dl, you take the, for an integer l, the maximum number of, of a union of l decreasing subsequence. And then green theorem, it's a deep theorem, it's not obvious to prove. That if you take the RS 
the Robinson set correspondence, you get a, a pair PQ. So the PQ have a shape, certain shape, a partition lambda 1, lambda k, with a common shape of P and Q. Then this number i k of sigma, maximum quantity of union of k intrinsic subsequent, exactly the number of elements of the first k row. And duality, the maximum canality of subsequence, which are union of L decreasing subsequence, is the sum of the first, the canality of the first L columns. Uh, for example, here, for this example here, the example we showed before, for example, the, the number of elements, the first row is eight, and this is exactly the maximum canality of subsequence, or union of two subsequence. For example, the, the first two columns is six. This is the maximum quantity of subsequent union of two decreasing subsequent. So here is the example of my permutation. So the first, first row, you, you get an increasing subsequent of size five. The first two rows, you can get this. But this is not a good example because the maximum union, you see, I get two increasing subsequent, and which is a union of the first one, five, plus three, but sometimes you cannot do that. You have to, you have to, it's completely chance. Sometimes it's going to be, uh, to, to get eight, there was five elements as maximum number of elements in the first row. Sometimes to get eight, you, you get four and four. So it's more, it's deeper theorem. You just add, uh, don't have to add uh, like this uh, a simple example. Okay, we will finish uh, with the, uh, I, will, I will stop here. Okay, so thank you very much.